This is Jeff Gomez, Marketing Director at Upnest. Today, I'll be talking with Brendan Bardick, a real estate agent in the Denver area. Brendan is a top agent on Upnest, and he'll be explaining his method for success. Let's start at the beginning. Um, how did you become a real estate agent? Yeah, so uh, I became a real estate agent. I uh, was in the uh, U.S. Army Infantry. And when I left the army, I went to work uh, for Ritz Carlton Hotel Company. Um, I quickly kind of went up through their system and became a hotel manager for Ritz Carlton. When uh, um, there was the conflict, when we went in and removed Saddam from uh, Saddam Hussein from Iraq, um, I received a call from a previous general that I worked with and said, "We need somebody with luxury hotel experience." and a military uh, infantry background. And obviously that was an interesting combination. So Seriously. they hired me to go to, yeah, to go over to Kuwait and Iraq. And I ran several hotels in each location for foreign dignitaries that were coming in and out of, of the country to help, you know, you know, do everything, the reconstruction, burn all of the Iraqi money and, you know, institute a new monetary system. Uh, so in doing that, uh, I was in a lot of ways doing property management in a very bizarre, uh, rare format. So after I finished my contract um, as a private contractor overseas, I came back and I was like, oh, I'm going to be, become a property manager. Like That's kind of what I was doing and it, it was cool and I enjoyed it. Uh, so I went to real estate school and once I went to real estate school, the instructor was like, you talk way too much to be in property management. It was like, you would, you would be much more suited for general real estate. And I said, all right, well, I appreciate that. So I went and interviewed with a top producing agent in our area, um, got hired as her assistant. And I went on, I mean, I started making eight bucks an hour being her real estate assistant, went on from there to be an agent on her team, then went to be an individual agent and then started my team. And now I have a, a team of 21 agents. Uh, I have a real estate brokerage of about 250 uh, agents in our, in our whole real estate brokerage. And I have a real estate coaching company, which is Brennan Bardic Real Estate Coaching, where we coach agents all across the nation to become elite agents. Well, that's probably the most interesting answer I've ever gotten to that. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. Are, are you still involved in like a military capacity in any way with anything that's happening in the Middle East? No, no, not at all. Yeah, no, it was just, it was so rare. I mean, I, I, I served my, my country, you know, and got out and, you know, thought I was going to end up being a hotel manager, you know, long term in my life and kind of, you know, do that, that whole thing. And this call came in and it was completely unexpected. And they told me how much I would make and they told me the danger involved. And I said, wait, go back to how much I'll make. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and then, yeah, I was gone. I mean, I was, I was in the green zone, like I was there when they removed Saddam from from the palace and like uh, tore his you know statues down and all that. It was, it was, an, it was a really insane time, but uh, but yeah, that's that's what got me into property management, and then that led to general real estate. That is a crazy story. Um, yeah. Do you ever like find yourself using the skills that you had over there in the Middle East? in your current day-to-day -day real estate uh, job, life? Oh, a absolutely. I think what people don't realize is when something like that's happening, it's, it's constant problem solving. I mean, every single day there was, you know, major, major, as you would imagine, logistical issues that were coming up. Because uh, you couldn't fly people into Baghdad because still during that time, people were shooting down the planes and all of this. So we would have big... Um, uh, convoys from Kuwait, we'd land in Kuwait, we'd bring in all of the people that needed to get to these certain locations in Iraq, and then we had to provide housing for them. Uh, and some of that housing was in hotels, some of that housing was in tents, some of that housing was in um, uh, uh, shipping containers. And so it was a logistical mm, <laughs> nightmare at times to know where people were, how they were getting there, who were the escorts and all of these things. So to say property management, it was, it was, I would say property management slash logistics was the big thing. So yeah, critical problem solving, I think was a big help. And then of course the military um, helped me kind of just learn some of the, the discipline skills that I needed to um, be somewhat successful at real estate. 
So how long have you been a real estate agent for? Uh, since, so this is going on now my 18th year. Hmm. And, and what have the ebbs and flows of your real estate life been like in those 18 years? Yeah, so I always tell this, so I did everything. I mean, as I said, I was an assistant, um, individual agent, team owner. So for a lot of years, once I uh, went and became an agent on my own and before I started to build my team, I was one of the, the top producing listing agents. I mean, I was selling over 130 listings myself, you know, and my assistants each and every year. And I did that for years and years, probably going on 10 years uh, of doing that. So I mean, I've gone on thousands and thousands of listing appointments. I have a passion for listings. Uh, um, you know, I, I built my career off of uh, expired for sell by owners, um, you know, making a, a lot of phone calls and, and knocking on doors and kind of doing the, the old school hustle way. And um, so with that, then that gave me a, a, a lot of leverage because obviously if you control listings you control your time and if you control your time you can do more and so as I as I did that I realized okay well this is great and now I can kind of teach a lot of what I've learned along this path because I mean I've seen probably can't say I've seen everything you can never say that but I've seen a lot of weird um, and I've dealt with every type of client every type of situation every type of agent and with that you realize there's a formula and a system that when done correctly works and it just it kind of you know it's compound interest it just starts to build on itself uh, it took me a while to understand those systems in the beginning I just worked a ton and and just thought hey if I just grinded through this it would work and then I realized a lot of it I just didn't have the right recipe so I got coaches I got mentors I I called tons of top agents across the country, and, and that's why I love doing what we're doing right now is there are hacks, there are shortcuts, there are secrets, uh, there are ways to do this a lot easier and a lot faster, but you can't if you, if you don't ask the right questions or even know what the right questions should be. Mm -hmm. That makes total sense. Um, yeah. A, a lot of this comes from experience, um, but you were also yeah. mentioning mentorships, uh, you know, podcasts, what would you say to anybody listening who's a real estate agent and who you know, maybe they have a year or two experience and they're, they're really just not getting where they need to be? Yeah. And Jeff, it's a great question. And uh, anytime anybody asks me that question, the number one thing I say is script practice. Yes. I always go back to practice, 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 practice. I would listen and I'm old, of course, now, but I, well, I'm going to say I'm old. I'm, I'm 42. Um, so in, in looking at this, uh, time frame, I mean, I joined the army when I was 17. And like I said, I was in Iraq when I was 20, you know, one, 22, right. uh, or 20, no, probably 20. Yeah. 22. I think it's 23. But anyway, looking at that time span, um, when I got into real estate, my mentor was a huge, uh, fanatic about coaching scripts and dialogues. So we had cassette tapes, we would record ourselves. We would have practice every single day uh, on just how to talk to people, how to negotiate deals, how to set appointments. Uh, and I still do it to this day. I've never stopped role playing in, in our coaching program. We have free national role play every Monday, uh, Tuesday and Thursday. Uh, so three times a week nationally and then inside our organization, we do it every morning for 15 minutes. Um, but, but with that, it, you get, you don't want to practice on your clients. That's what I tell people. You know, you, you, they think you get into real estate and you're going, you know what? I like people. They like me. Uh, that should be enough. And then you go on your first listing appointment and you, you look like an idiot, right? Or you go on a listing appointment and then someone on my team or I come in behind you and the difference of what that client's receiving is massively different from a, from a professionalism standpoint. And it's not that we were more professional. We just practice our presentations more. We practice our scripts and dialogues. We practice objections. So when the client says, yeah, you know, we only want a 30-day listing. Or the client says, um, you know what, Brennan, you seem great, but we want to talk to four other agents. What do you say in that split second, right, to save, to, to make sure that you get to work with this client? 
and it happens that fast. Mm-hmm. So, so that's the one thing I say, Jeff, is it's just practice. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta come to role play. You gotta do script practice, record yourself, videotape yourself doing your listing presentation and buyer consultations. So you can deliver the most exceptional experience once you're out there with the public. Right. Is there a perfect script that every realtor could use or does it depend on the realtor? Yes. So that's a great question. So the couple of things, there's foundational scripts for what I call the top seven lead buckets, right? So you've got expireds for sell by owners, the any D list, this is people that are going into foreclosure, absentee owners just listed. We just listed a house in your neighborhood. We just sold a house in your neighborhood, uh, center of influence and past clients. And so when we go through these fundamental scripts, what we realize is most people don't call their database, people that know them because they don't know what to say. They don't have any reason to call them except, of course, they're to ask for business because they're, they're not sure how to explain the value that they can provide to their clients. So our scripts are designed on how can you interact and build great deep relationships with the people that you're, you're in contact with without sounding like a scumbag salesperson. Mm-hmm. And, to, and to do that, it takes some scripting. And then you have to, so the first thing is script, you know, reading scripts. And then what our favorite word is, is you have to internalize it. So internalizing a script just means you've done it so many times that it sounds like you, you're not thinking about the script, you're doing it subconsciously, but you're hitting all the key points. And then the biggest piece is objection handlers. So scripts are fine, right? I could call you up, Jeff, and I'd be like, hey, Jeff, I saw your property came off the market yesterday, and I could run through a whole script if you're an expired. That's mm-hmm. fine. That'll, that'll get you half, you know, not even half. That'll give you in the, in the call. But then at, we have 50-plus objections that we know every single person are usually going to have. And when we say objections, these are just things like, I always give the analogy, Jeff, like, you, you know you need to buy a new pair of jeans, right? You know it. You know you need jeans. You walk into the store at the mall, and the lady asks you, can I help you with anything? You go, no, just looking, <laughs> right? You came there to get jeans. <laughs> you know you need them, but your natural objection is immediately, you know, no, I'm okay. Now in that second, if that sales associate has an objection handler, she's going to be able to work with you and make a sale, possibly. If she just goes, okay, have a great day, no sale. Right. That's so that's what we try to really, yeah, yeah. So that's what we really try to go through. So once you understand that there's about, 50 that any certain person could say if you're you memorize them internalize them and you can re, you can regurgitate them uh i always call it like your mental rolodex right you're going but you're just flipping through and you're going oh boom oh that one um and it just helps you build up all our thing is is we just want to build better relationships and a lot of times that just means that we have to continue the conversation if conversation ends very abruptly how can i build a relationship i can't it's gone that's that's so funny i can i I've definitely walked into stores before needing something. Someone's asked me if I need anything and I say no. They walk away and I'm like, why did I say that? <laughs> I, I go back and say, where are the jeans? Um, yep. I, I guess the obvious follow-up question for anybody who's listening who, who desperately wants me to ask this, but how can, how can those people find these scripts or make these scripts if they're not available online? Yeah, no, so they are. So you can go and get all of our scripts for free. It's at Brendan, brendanbartik.com. So B-R-E-N-D-A-N-B-A-R-T-I-C.com. We give out our free script book, all of our objection handlers, and we refined them over the last however many years. You know, probably we really started getting deep into them probably about 15 years ago um, in trial and error. You know, a lot of stuff we were like, we got some scripts from some other, some other agent and we we're like, that kind of worked, but we were getting smoked here and there. So I think it's the same thing. I think it's, You'll make it your own. There's not a single script out there that you read and you go, you know what? That sounds just like me. Well, of course not. It's, it's not you. Someone else wrote it, right? But the same way is a, a famous actor goes and reads the script and makes it their own versus an actor that's terrible and goes and reads that same script. That's the difference between an Oscar and, and working on Nickelodeon. No offense. Right? <laughs> I'm sure Nickelodeon is great, right? But it's two different types of acting. So... So the great ones internalize it and make it their own. So yeah, you can go there. It has all of our scripts, our objection handlers. And then I would say that's the one piece you have to get into a community that practices. So on our our, our, our Facebook group, Brendan Bartik Real Estate Coaching uh, Facebook group, uh, you can join our Facebook group. You'll get all the Zoom links for the 
um, the sessions. Uh, I teach one, and then my lead ISA, my inside sales associate, teaches one, and then one of our other amazing coaches uh, teaches the other session. And each one of the sessions, the Monday session, is to just get a kind of understand scripts. It's like learn the scripts, get the scripts down, kind of understand that. Tuesdays are technical Tuesdays. So this is where we talk about, Jeff, we found the craziest thing with real estate agents. Like if I asked an agent, um, hey, uh, 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 Steve, how does a, um, how does a boiler work? <laughs> You'd be amazed how few people might know that answer. Now in your area, you might not have boi boilers, uh, maybe a septic tank. Uh, can you explain title insurance to me? Uh, can you, you know, we go through these things that you, you wouldn't know unless you had to practice it, but you don't want to find out when you're showing a house to a client and they go, Brandon, I, I, you know, this is my first mountain property or my first country property. Um, I, I don't know. How does this whole septic thing work? And you go, uh, I don't know. Let me make a call. Right. Are right. you going to have faith in that agent? No. So yeah. we practice those, those kinds of things. And then Thursday, on Thursdays, we have a, what we call Thursday throwdown. And this is just all objections. So we go through objection after objection and boom, boom, boom. We have kind of like a fun game show atmosphere. We get prizes and stuff. That's what I mean by a community is like, we just have to make things that we know we need fun, right? Like no one gets up. Like for me, I'm learning how to play golf this year. Jeff, I don't want to go to the driving range. It's not, it's not like the most fun thing I can possibly do. But if I don't, when I go to play with my friends, I look like an idiot. Mm -hmm. I don't want to yeah. look like an idiot. I got to go to the driving range. <laughs> Yeah, same same thing with everything. Practice makes perfect, I yeah. guess. Um, yeah. And and it's it's great hearing such a focus on that as well. Because when I ask, you know, what's really important for a real estate agent, a lot of people say, you know, uh, forming a good relationship with people, you know, knowing your stuff, yada yada yada. But it all comes down to practice, and it all comes down yep. to doing these objections, doing these game show type exercises. Uh, yeah. yeah, that make total sense. Oh, no, I just tell people, I mean, I know we do a lot of sports analogies, but if you want to cut, catch that game-winning touchdown, how many times do you think that wide receiver has practiced that, that play? You know, he's not, it's not his first time he's going to try to catch the ball. And I think, it's, I think it's arrogant of us, Jeff, as agents, to think that we don't need to practice our, our craft, right? Like if, if you were going to be a, a top surgeon in your area – you're going to have to go to school. You're going to have to practice on cadavers. You're going to have to do a million other crazy things, right? So why are we any different as real estate professionals? Yeah, I think it's a great way of looking at it. Yeah. yeah. How, how often do your scripts change? Do you ever write a script one year, think it's amazing, come back to it after a couple months and be like, eh, this needs a few tweaks? Oh, you're, you're absolutely correct. Yeah, all the time. 1000%. I mean, I mean, we refine, 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 refine. And even this year, there were certain things where we had to create different skips and last year, right? So COVID and, and different things and um, how to explain how to do digital listing presentations via Zoom or Google Meetup or whatever it is. So, so the times change as well. How do you combat an iBuyer, right? How do we stop Zillow? Uh, not stop Zillow, you're not going to stop, you know, <laughs> you know what I mean? But like when your client goes, hey, Brennan, I might list my house, but hey, I got this offer from Zillow. Well, we didn't have that script two years ago. Right. Right. So the evolution continues to happen based upon the current problems we're facing. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, there's still some classic ones that are never going to change. Right. Uh, I don't want to list during the holidays. That's never that objection is never going to change. Right. <laughs> like so. So you, you, you have to be able to have a very educated response to respond to someone to help move them past that. And and that's what we work on. Yeah. And and every year at Upnest, we see this big downturn during the holidays. I wish that more yeah. worked on that objection. <laughs> that would help us out a lot. Um, talking about trends and changes, you're probably sick of talking about this, but tell me about how COVID affected what you did um, in the past couple of years, past two years. Yeah, no. So it was massive. I mean, uh, again, if you think about, um, you know, expired listings and well, two weird things happened. Number one, COVID happened. And then number two, the market exploded and everyone here, especially locally in the Denver Front Range area, wanted to move out of the city and out of condos and things like that right. and move into a, a bigger house somewhere else. Right. So so looking at that. Uh, we, we were faced with two issues. We had no inventory 
And when we had to go and help people sell in, in this reduced uh, uh, accessibility climate, no one, we couldn't get people in uh, to sell their house. So we were kind of stuck in this. So, so the way that we solved all these issues is we realized, okay, look, can we show a house without physically being there? And can the sellers show the house using iPad, virtual things and all that? Uh, taking that a step back, can we do virtual presentations at the highest level? And it did change. We still do now. We're so much more equipped to do virtual presentations that it really helped us with our absentee owner clients, meaning clients that own homes here that live in another state. You know, it kind of amped that game up for us. And once we realized we could do that, we were like, well, why aren't we calling people that live, that own homes, that their, their home address is in another state and say, hey, is there any way we can help you? Because then you had uh, member tenants stop paying rent. So we had the, the moratorium on these. So all these different things started to happen. And every, so in, in our organization, we have a monthly strategy session where the team comes together for three hours and we just, we whiteboard all these issues and we say, okay, look, here's what we're getting hit with. What do we do? How do we adjust to be ahead of this? And, and at least to be on it and then be ahead of it. But it, it, it changed quite a bit. I mean, we're still in a very low inventory situation. Um, we have uh, buyers that are getting priced out of the market, meaning that in our market, if you're a VA, FHA, or using any kind of, of government-funded program to help you be able to purchase a home, you can't. You have to go for, You have to go so far out. And so that's those are the challenges I think we're going to be facing next. Is when will the market correct? and forecasting the market correction to allow the regular working American to have home, home ownership. Because right now, yeah. unless you're cash or you have a really, really good job or a lot of money, you can't buy a house here. Yeah, we, we recently moved from the Bay Area to the Seattle area, partially because we're looking for a home up here. It's going to be so much cheaper. Right. What do you think? Do you, how long do you think it's going to take for the market to equalize? Or, or do you think it will at all? Is this the new normal? No, great question. So I, I love, I, I mean, I'm a, I am a st statistician at heart. So forecasting this out, I mean, as we take a look into the next year, especially here locally, so it'll, it'll continue to go up for about another year. I mean, the government just printed more money than, than ever in the history of the planet. We've got a lot of other, other, uh, other factors going into inflation and all of this. But usually a normal real estate cycle is seven to 10 years. And our last real blip in the real estate universe was 2010. Mm -hmm. So if you think about it, and you can look back historically over all of time, it kind of runs the same pattern. So we're probably about a year past that edge of a correction. Now we're going to go two years. So we're really pushing that envelope. And again, because of COVID and these types of things, obviously made things a little bit more unique. But look at the stats. I mean, more people are quitting their jobs than ever. Uh, unemployment can't continue to, to go like this for a long time. At some point, it always auto-corrects. And I'm always laughing about this stuff where everybody's shocked. They're yeah. like, what? And you're like, well, did you think this 600-foot condo was going to be 800 grand in this neighborhood? And people, I think, just get so consistently excited that it's going to never stop going up until it stops. And so... Looking at it, it becomes to a point of affordability, of course, becomes one of those major factors. The government programs can't catch up enough to help the regular working person get to where they need to go. And the, there's obviously the rich keep getting richer. There's going to be a luxury market that continues to sustain for a certain amount of time. I mean, I, I live in a, in a, I'd say a pretty nice neighborhood and there's 42 custom uh, properties that start at 2 million and above that are under contract right now. 42, right? Like that's insane to think about it um, in, in a neighborhood. And when you look at this, it's like, okay, well, all those people are doing this. They're obviously doing quite well. If we look at the trickle down though, I have bartenders, servers, uh, everything else where they cannot buy. So what'll happen is, of course, they can continue to rent, as we've seen in New York and San Francisco, and like you said, in California and other areas, till a point, though, where at some, at some point, a seller is going to need to sell their house. There will not be enough buyers that can afford it for them to sell it. Right. And that's when the market corrects. I've read all these apocalyptic articles about <laughs> buyers and 
every house in America is going to get bought by some giant corporation and they're just going to, yeah. and there's yep. going to be no more homeowners. It's going to be a feudal society. What do you think about that? Not, not really. Well, we saw, we saw the news that came out with Zillow's iBuyer program yesterday. I don't know if you, right. you, if you saw that, but right. They've suspended it. They've laid off everyone. I think a lot of times what was the difficult thing for me being in this business a long time, and I'm not the smartest guy on earth by any means, but if I look at it and I go, okay, the, the, when you have big corporations look at something and they say, hey, we're going to, to, to buy, like you said, let's say Zillow says, I want to buy every house and make it a rental. Well, that sounds cool. A, uh, I mean, it, it, it's not to say it's not possible, but the biggest piece of this faction is, is that at some point, people will move. What they didn't factor in is people being able to re work remotely. So they can, right now, like you just did, you can work pretty much probably in a lot of different areas. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter. So it'll get to the point where you're going, am I going to live in downtown San Francisco and pay $2,000 a square foot when I can do my job via Zoom or via whatever, and I can move further out and actually have five feet of grass? Right. Yeah. That's what's happening. And that's what Zillow and these guys can't understand is they just thought, Look, supply and demand in any specific, you know, metropolitan location, if there's enough, if we take up and gobble up the supply, then we make everybody a renter, the demand will be strong enough to be there. No, the demand will leave. Do you think that, so obviously, so there, there's this huge push to leave the, leave the urban centers, head to the suburbs. Sure. That's what I did. A lot of people are doing partially because you don't need to commute anymore. A lot of people don't need to commute anymore. Do you think that that's a new permanent facet of the real estate industry that, you know, urban homes are going to be less valuable and these suburban, more rural homes are going to be more valuable? No. And Jeff, I, I love this kind of question because I've had this with all kind of top agents across the country. So, um, and not only top agents, business owners and all this. So the answer is no, people will always return back to city centers because of simple things. Like the same thing I said, I lived in a city center and I moved out during COVID. I mean, I was a, a block away from uh, Coors Field where the Rockies play, right? And it was so fun and it was vibrant and all this. And so people are always going to want to live in these areas that have this sense of arts and community. And, it, and it's been for thousands of years this way, right? Just because we've had this blip, you already see people journeying back into it. Like even on our downtown market, it dropped dramatically. I mean, the market went in the toilet. I told everyone buy in downtown Denver right now. Well, as soon as it hits bottom or gets closer to hitting bottom and it's already gone back up, I think 12% um, that quickly because Again, once people aren't scared, they'll feel more comfortable. When they feel more comfortable, then they're, they're going to want to be close to all the fun stuff. You know, the nice thing about living downtown, I live out in the, the boonies now, comparatively, and we have one restaurant we can go to besides our clubhouse. And it sounds very douchey to say, but it's like, <laughs> that sucks. When I, live, when I live downtown on any given night, I could have everything right there within a two-minute Uber ride. Uh, and, or a scooter ride, which is also fun, right? Or, you know, little scooters and have all of this. It was, it was amazing. But when COVID hit, all of the things got shut down, all of the homeless took over and it became more of a reason of security. I couldn't be down there anymore. I was scared to go take my trash out. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, so that, that they can, those are fixable problems, I guess is my point. Unless of course there's another major pandemic. Right. <laughs> right. We were, uh, we, we were on a Zoom call with our friends who live in Brooklyn and, you know, we were showing them our views, showing them our trees, showing them our lawn and showing off our, our you know, our totally lovely little rental house here in the suburbs. And, and they started talking about how every morning they take their stroll around, they walk, they get a cup of coffee, they go to the park. Yeah. My wife and I just looked at each other and we were like, yeah, we kind of miss that. That is completely that definitely. We're going to miss more and more uh, and there's a reason to go. Well, back. and I miss all my friends, our house, everybody right. would come over because they could have a good time. And then now to come to where I live now, they're like, well, that's a 45 minute Uber, which is going to cost me $140 because, you know, if I have more than one glass of wine, we're not going to, you know, be stupid out here. And right. so, yeah, you just, you kind of get more disconnected. And so, and I, I think if you're single, I mean, you know, that's even, that's really tough, you know, yeah. like to live in the suburbs. So, 
So yeah, I think the the city centers will come back stronger than ever. And as long as there's not, you know, again, major medical reasons. Yeah. And hopefully there's not, but well, hopefully not. <laughs> um, that's some really interesting insights. Um, yeah. About the whole current situation, uh, changing tracks a little bit. Um, it, what is when you're talking to clients, potential clients, what is the most important thing for them to understand about you? Let's say that, you know, you brought this up earlier. They say, Hey, Brendan, I really like you. I have these four other clients or four other agents that I want to talk to. What do you tell them? Oh, I love this. So, so Jeff, I, I teach a, a course called listing mastery. So I, I dove deep into what do clients want and what do they want out of this uh, experience? And I went through all of the Google surveys, Zillow surveys, and I, I know these stats pretty much off the top of my head. 49% of all clients put number one above anything else, um, trust. They want to feel like they can trust you, which sounds like duh, right? Like no kidding, but that's easier said than done. And so you have to think about, well, how, how am I able? So it's like 49% is trust. Uh, it drops significantly from that. I think the next number is like 23% is you were referred by a friend or a family member is why they would use you. The next right. one is like your experience. I think goes to like 16%. They care about your experience. Like you're looking at this on a pie chart, right? It's like experience. And then the next one down from there is able to get the job done fast is like 9%. And at the very bottom, which shocks all the agents I talk to, 2% care about what brand you have and what brand you work for. Hmm. 2%, yeah. right? They just don't care. They care, can I trust this person, right? I just really want to be able to trust them. So what we work on a lot is how do we provide value and how do we have the ability to build instant rapport, or instant trust with a client? And what we've discovered in, in looking at this, you know, stripping it all back is, there's a system to it. There's a system to building trust. Uh, and when we look at it, we, we know as, as real estate professionals, it comes down to our listing presentation, our buyer consultation, and then how we build relationships with people over the phone. So if we go back to the listing presentation for a second, one of the things that we discovered is to build trust, we need to be able to objection block instead of objection handle. And what I mean by that, Jeff, is if I'm objection blocking, I know that every seller's gonna have probably the same four to five concerns. Commission, um, the price that we're gonna list the house for, what marketing we're going to do, staging, um, how long is it going to take? But what we discovered and what we mean by objection blocking is if I cover those items in a very good presentation and the seller never has to vocalize to me, so, uh, so Brennan, you know, so let's talk commission. As soon as they have to vocalize that question, it's so much harder for me to get past it and build trust because now I have to defend my commission. If I explained my commission during my presentation and I was very precise about it, I had very clear estimated net sheets. I go, this is how our, our structure works. Right? We use a, a variable structure, which, you know, helps a lot. And, and But it's so simple. Well, if they never have to voice that objection, then we're building more rich rapport and trust, right? If I never have to explain it to them about how our staging works or any of this, every seller is just looking at us as sales professionals going, okay, what's your angle? Mm -hmm. Right? Think about it. I, I had a guy come over to, to, at our old place before we moved out uh, to, to put in new windows. And it was this great window presentation. And he brought like, he brought a window frame that he like hit with a hammer to show me how great the window was. And mm -hmm. All of this, right? To sell me, windows and he had this high pressure kind of situation where he had this ipad and he was like but if you sign with me right now okay i know i said it was twenty we we'll cut it immediately to eleven thousand dollars <laughs> right and do you think i left that meeting feeling like i could trust this guy mm -hmm. no right like i was so turned off by it because they were doing 1975 window selling tactics and so i asked him i go uh, after we didn't buy windows from him i i called him up yeah. and i said where, did you have to go to like, do they take you to this class? He goes, our company sends us to this four day intensive seminar where they teach us these techniques. And I'm not saying they don't work. Maybe they do on a lot of other people probably do. Right. Like, you know, I'm, I'm sure they do. But when I started thinking about this, I go, 
I want, I don't want to feel like I have to shower after every meeting, <laughs> you know, yeah. I, you know, that was our, my, our whole thing is I wanted to go in, be straight up, be honest, be effective and be professional. And when I'm done with my presentation, and when I say presentation, it's not like they sit there and don't talk the whole time. Our presentation is designed around conversation. So when we, when we're, when we finish this consultation is a better word. When we finish this consultation, they look at each other, the couple or the, or, or even if it's just an individual, they, they either look at each other and they go, I guess there's nothing left to do, but sign, right? Let's move forward. This guy sounds legit. Like, I feel like I can trust him. Like I have had clients look at each other and they go, Susie, I just got a good feeling to you. And she's like, yeah, let's do it. That's all I can hope for. Yeah. Right. That's what I want. Now, instead of them looking at each other and going, so Brennan, yeah, I think we really, we want to sleep on it tonight. Right. If I hear I want to sleep on it, I didn't do something right in that situation. Mm -hmm. I think it's a great way of looking at it. And now I have to get past it with an objection handler instead of blocking it earlier on. Yeah. That that window guy's presentation might work on some people, but it's definitely not going to be built Ooh. for us. Ooh. It just reminded me of like those, you know, the, the high pressure car salesman, right? It's like, all right, you're going to look great in this car. Go ahead and get in there. Oh my gosh, this car makes you look sexy. And you're like, oh, get me out of here. Yeah. You know, like it's just, and I always tell people, I go, are you giving a Ferrari dealership experience or are you selling Honda Civics? Nothing wrong with Honda Civics, but mm -hmm. the big difference is one is 25,000, one is 500,000. There is a big difference. When I go into a Ferrari dealership, does the guy run up to me and it's like all up on me and trying to you know, lock me out? And No, you come in, there's classical music playing. They ask you if you want a cup of coffee or a nice beverage. You know, it's a different experience. Yeah. You you mentioned about that being kind of a 19, whatever you said, 1975 aesthetic feel, pressure yeah. situation. Do you think that there's a general shift in in a lot of industries to go more towards this trust-based experience? Or is it, you know, a lot of it's not changing? Depends on the, the target market. Right. Like I know an agent that works in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. His average sales price is eighty thousand dollars for these condos in Myrtle Beach. Right. Mm -hmm. So when I say that, that's a different type of product and a different type of consumer that he's selling to because he has to do a lot more volume, a lot faster. A lot of the people are retired and they're on fixed incomes. So I think it's a situational. And then I coach, you know, I coach a great agent, uh, Christy Morrison, shout out to her in uh, Tahoe. Uh, she works in Tahoe. Her average sales price is like a million one. Right. Well, that's a different conversation, right? I teach, you know, agents in all these different areas. So I think it depends on the product uh, a lot, right? Um, and, and that makes the big difference on framing your presentation. I think for us as really good sales professionals, we have to think about the avatar, if you will, or the, the, the person uh, that we're selling to. What are their specific needs? What matters the most to them? And is our presentation and our sales designed to, to resonate with them? Mm -hmm. um, and it's customizable. It, it really is. But to answer your question in a very short answer, yes, I think, of course, our goal, any company's goal, is to try to build and earn your trust. Any good company that wants to be, you know, around for a while, wants to build and earn your trust, and then build a referral-based business at times based upon that trust measure. So when somebody hears Jeff, you're in a restaurant, you happen to mention to to someone just lightly, going, "Hey, you know what? I think we're thinking about, uh, you know, buying here in Seattle." The person behind you in the chair behind you just barely heard that. They're, they grab you and they go, did I hear you say you did everything about buying? <laughs> You've got to talk to my guy, Brendan. He's right. the best. That's what we want is those, I mean, you know, they say cheesy all the time, raving fans. Like, like uh, we teach in our model, you only need 500 of those types of people in your organization and you'll net a million dollars each and every year or more. 500, what we call Mets, people that know you, love you, that would refer business to you that are on a 33 touch or more system each and every year, meaning I have to touch them and, you know, not physically, but direct mail, uh, market reports, pop buys, personal notes, phone calls, 33 times a year. So I stay in relationships with these people or my team stays in relationships. So when that time comes, I get that trust, which is all I want. Well, that's a great segue to my last question. Um, yeah which is 
what are the resources that you have available and how can people find them? No, absolutely. So, so brendanbardic.com is our, is the, the website for our coaching company. It's just my name, real estate coaching, pretty, pretty original. Um, but, uh, but yeah, we have that. We have our YouTube channel, which has been extremely popular. Most people come to me because they're like, Hey, I saw your YouTube video. So it's Brendan Bardic real estate coaching YouTube channel. Uh, you can subscribe to that. I put all of this information out there for, for everyone to see. Uh, I just love, you know, I have a passion for real estate listings changed my life. I mean, as I said, I, I had a weird entryway into this. And even working for Rich Carlton, working for this, this foreign contracting company, um, I realized I never want to work for anyone ever again. Number one, I think that's why a lot of us get into real estate. And number two, I want to be able to, to do really amazing things with my, um, with my time and listings and, and being able to build. And I know I just keep saying, listen, I'm not saying we don't work with buyers. You need to have both. But I always tell people, if you have the listings, the buyers will come, right? You control the inventory. You control all those connections. There's so many agents out there. Jeff, we just ran these stats the other day. Um, in our market, we have 19,000 real licensed real estate agents. 19,000. 19,000. Out of that 19,000, less than 100 had sold more than 10 listings in a 12-month period. Right. Less than a hundred out of nineteen thousand. That means those hundred, and, and I'm I'm included in one of those hundred, right? Um, we're the ones that are controlling all the inventory, and all these other agents are running around showing a thousand houses, bringing buyers to us. Right. That's so crazy, if once that, that's 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 pretty nuts. Yeah. So once you understand that concept, we find that the reason that people don't do this, and to answer your question of getting involved. Right. We really teach a very formulated, systematic way of, you know, getting just understanding the business. And once you do, it's more fun. We, we do. We have a lot of accountability. We have it's just a model. We go, you start here and this is where you're at. And we're going to get you. I call it the real estate Olympics. Right. You tell me, Brendan, I want to go and get a gold medal in the real estate Olympics. And we've got, you know, one year, three years, four years to do it. I'll back out a reverse engineer a plan to help you get there. So yeah, that all starts through, we have a couple of different programs. We have one-on-one -on -one coaching. We have our group coaching series, which is called our Elite Progression Series, which is a much more affordable option uh, that's all explained on the website. And then just our free community, you know, get, get started on just the, the role plays. And we have live webinars each and every month that cover how to combat, how to combat an eye buyer, right? How to combat or uh, how, to, how to work with expired listings, something there that we can provide value so yeah, check out the free stuff first. If you like that, then then get deeper into it and take your career where you want to go. That's awesome. And I, I guess that reminds me of one actual final question, which is, uh, how's your experience with Upnest been? Um, oh, would you recommend Upnest oh. uh, agents who are looking for more leads? Oh, phenomenal. I mean, uh, Jeff, beyond phenomenal. So I, I say to everyone uh, all the time, I go, I go, when I look back, I mean, I remember Simon uh, and me talking, Simon, the, the, your guys' is the CEO. Uh, we talked years and years ago, and um, I was talking about, you know, how amazing, I think we were one of the first teams to really embrace it. He said, Brendan, we have, we have a, your team picture up here in our office. And I, and I remember he I, sent me a picture. Uh, my desk was right beneath it when I started, actually. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's right. Yeah. And so, so I was laughing about that, and I said it, it'll change your life. Um, I think you know, just like every everything that we're looking at, it's what you put into it. You guys have created a very amazing platform that gives the client experience a way to build trust faster. And if and doing you know our our um, our why can't I think of the word not profile when we submit our template. What's the word? I'm, um, you guys, it's called something else. I'll think about it in a second. Whatever, but yeah, yeah, whether it's yes, whatever. We when we submit when we when, when you know there's an there's a client out there that's going. You know what? I'm looking for a good, great, wonderful agent in X Y city. Then us as agents have the ability to come and say, look, here's what we do. Here's our track record. Here's how we've had success. Here's how we know we can help. And then the consumer gets to decide very quickly, either from that a phone call do I trust this person and do I feel like I want to make it go to the next level? So you guys have just really done an amazing job of giving us that first level of, of matching us to, to amazing clients. I think where, where agents have to realize it is it's on us to take it the rest of the way. 
mm-hmm. you know, like then we've got to run with it. Of course, you guys have great follow up. I mean, I think a lot of times I tell people up all the time, I go, if it wasn't for Upness telling me to follow up, I might have forgot. Right. <laughs> I love that. Right. That's our, you know, every agent will tell you their biggest fall down is follow up. Right? right. So so we're trying to always make sure that we're staying connected because we know two things. The average cycle time of a buyer referral, 565 days. Right. You might get somebody. This is over all Internet. It's not yours. I'm sure your guys are a lot more because you guys do a lot more filtering and pre-screening type stuff. But in, just a general Internet lead. It could take 565 days on average for that person to actually end up purchasing. Right. Okay. They might purchase day one. And you've got some people that might take two years to find a house. So I think about that all the time and then we go, okay, it's got to be follow up. You guys help with that at such a high level. It's, it's, it's invaluable. And then on the sell side, they've tracked it where it's about 126 days. Again, another reason to work with listings, right? On any listing seller lead or referral you get, it usually can take, it could happen day one, right? They could be like, come over and list. And you're like, high five, great. <laughs> and sometimes it could take a little bit longer, not because of you, because of their situation, right? Like, like they, they want to, they, they're having surgery and they, they have to wait for their hip to be, you know, there's so many weird reasons, but that's what I love the most is giving us the platform to get in front of amazing people that have now become some of my best friends, right? Which is also crazy talking about building relationships, right? If it wasn't for up and that's probably like people I play golf with every week doesn't even exist anymore, <laughs> right? Like it's so cool, but we also have to be very, I think my message to all the agents is, Take, take pride in it. Be responsible for what you're putting out there. If you don't have a great value proposition, let's go to work and make it better, right? Like, like if you're just hoping that, hey, I'm kind of charismatic and I'm going to make this rock and if they give me a lead, I'm going to go in there and just, just make this lady or guy fall in love with me, it could work. I'm not saying it's not going to possibly happen sometimes, but wouldn't it be better to walk in and go, when, they're, when you're done meeting with them, they go, this is, the, this is the best thing i ever heard in my entire life. You seem amazing, and, and I want to work with you and also want to tell everybody about you. Why are we not striving for that? That's awesome. Um, I'm glad that Upness has worked so well for you. Well for you. That's great. To Fantastic. Yeah. Um, cool. Well, we, we went over a lot. I think it's going to be super helpful for any agents who are listening to it. Uh, Good. Thanks for taking the, the time, Brendan. This was uh, yeah. great, and uh, hopefully no. we'll do it again. Yeah, Jeff, I'm always here for anyone from you, as you guys know, your organization or any agents I can help out there, just let us know. And uh, I appreciate the opportunity. Awesome. I'll, I'll put a link to your website in the description for anybody who's interested. Thanks good. so much. Awesome. All right. Thanks so much, Brendan. Have a good one.